seated. Now this morning, we're in for a treat. It is my pleasure to welcome to the podium this morning, Reverend Michael Record, who is going to stimulate your mind, cause you to think, and hopefully to move beyond this day with a new way of being in this world. Please help me welcome Reverend Michael. Thank you so much, Carol. I didn't tell her what I was going to talk about, but that's exactly what I hope to do. Stimulate your mind and leave you with something to, as Reverend Elmer, our founder, used to say, something to chew on, something to think about. Good morning, friends. Welcome to you all here at the Temple of Light Center for Spiritual Living for our Sunday morning service and a warm welcome to those listening to me online. That's literally and figuratively a warm welcome for it's warm here in Kingston, Jamaica and getting warmer by the minute. I'm sweating under this. It's warm and beautiful thanks to the generous rain feeding the trees, grass, and flowers over the past several months. Ernest Holmes, the founder of our church, now called Centers for Spiritual Living, and the conceptualizer of religious science, AKA Science of Mind, our teaching, religion, and philosophy. Look on the back of your program and you see it so described. Wrote, I quote, having read Emerson, it was easy to realize that unity is the basis of everything. That's the title of my talk. In this talk, I'd like to touch on some of the ramifications of the statement, unity is the basis of everything. I want to do two things fundamentally. One, show that the lesson of unity comes to us from a multitude of sources and have been coming to us over the ages from everywhere you look. And two, suggest what a world would look like if we acted as if that statement were true. Let me explain the source of the phrase, everywhere you look. Some years ago, I was reading an excerpt from one volume in Neil Donald Walsh's Conversations with God series. He has about seven or eight of them. Walsh is complaining in that excerpt to God that he, God, is often absent from Walsh's life, especially in times of desperate need. God replies, on the contrary, he's always present. But where, where do I see you? Walsh asks. God's reply, everywhere you look, was like an electric jolt through my brain a sort of eureka, I got it moment. It caused me to look at the world differently from then. When you realize that everywhere in the world you look, you can see God, it changes your thinking about the world. Most of you know the sayings. When you change the way you look at things, the things you look at, change. And another, change your thinking, change your life. Powerful statements. You won't be surprised that in preparing this talk, the first place I looked to find Holmes's thoughts about unity was the religious science declaration of principles, which Holmes himself wrote. 
You have it in your program. It's on the inside cover. We find numerous references to unity or oneness, starting with the opening clause, which describes God as the almighty living spirit. That means the only living spirit there is has all the power in the universe. That makes sense to us. Reason logically. In an orderly universe like the one we have, we can't conceive of a power greater than God. And what would be the point of a power lesser than God? If you have a bank account with one million dollars, a second bank account with five dollars is unnecessary. If you have a cell phone that can do everything you want, why well, have a less powerful one? God is also described in that first paragraph as indestructible, absolute, and self-existent. God can't be destroyed, and God is not the effect of a previous cause. It is the first cause of everything. Contained in that idea, of course, is the concept of oneness. Holmes expands on that point in the second clause, which is that this one, God, manifests itself in, is found in, all the things it created. So there is nowhere that God is not. The third clause puts that thought more concretely so that we can actually visualize it. I quote, the manifest universe is the body of God. Easy for us to visualize. All the things that we see around us make up God's body. This lectern, the chair you're sitting in, the floor on which it rests, those trees, the earth, all are part of God's body. And just in case you think Holmes is only talking about inanimate objects, he makes it clear in the third clause that human beings are part of God's body too. I quote, all men are incarnations of the one spirit. So we are one, as he states in clause eight, we believe in the unity of all life. So there is one life, not your life, your neighbor's life, and my life separately, just one. We can assume that even animals and plants, which also have life, share that one life. Clause 11, as set out in our program, and I'm talking about the program where the Declaration of Principles is used as our, our um, alternative, responsive reading. There, there are other versions, but that's the one that I've, I was using for this. <coughs> Clause 11 does something quite interesting. It differentiates between God as universal spirit and God as universal mind. We've already seen that spirit is creative, for it created the manifest universe, its body. We saw that in paragraph one. Now we learn that spirit operates through universal mind, which Holmes calls the law of God. Interesting, isn't it, that even God operates through law. But you shouldn't just think that's interesting with your intellect. I mean, academically, it's so, of academic interest only. No, it leads on to what for me is the heart of the declaration. In the next clause, number 12, we see how all the theory that we have been getting so far from clause one up to, up to to 11. In 12, we see how this theory actually works. Notice that all the previous clauses begin with the phrase, we believe, and so and so. 
and also all the others that follow, we believe so and so, except for the very last one. Again, I'm talking about the responsive reading format. But clause 12 now begins, we are surrounded and goes on to explain how we get what we want in life. We are surrounded by God's creative mind, Holmes says. And maybe he should have said God's creative spirit since he was talking about spirit as the creative part of God. Anyway, God's mind, I quote, receives the direct impress of our thoughts and acts upon it. The key word receives the impress of our thoughts and acts upon it. When we think into the one mind, which is the mind of the living spirit almighty, that mind responds to our thoughts. All the power in the universe moves, rearranges itself when we think to support us. And that theory is the foundation on, what, on which religious science and new thought generally is based. That's the heart of our religion, philosophy, teaching. Can you imagine how different the world would be if all the other religions accepted that concept? All the terrorism and oppression taking place in the name of God would cease immediately. There would be peace in the Middle East at last, after thousands of years, just accepting that concept. The universal mind receives the impress of our thoughts, whatever we think, and acts upon it. Of course, you shouldn't think that all you have to do to succeed in this world is think into God's mind and God will do everything else for you. If you thought that, you'd be forgetting clause number three, which we refer to, about the manifest universe being the body of God. You are God's body, including God's hands. So, led by God's mind, you need to use those hands to do the appropriate physical work. You can't expect God's spirit to cook your dinner for you. Spirit can't put a pot on fire. Have you ever thought that if we didn't have physical things to do, not only would we be bored stiff, but we'd have no physical pleasures? And aren't you glad that you have a body? A bodiless life is for the next phase of existence. In the Science of Mind, which is our main textbook, Dr. Holmes paints a very dark picture of the consequences of believing in duality, the opposites of unity, of oneness. He says, I quote, the belief in duality has given rise to the idea of a god and a devil, each with equal power to impose upon man a blessing or a curse. And men have worshipped the devil just as truly as they have worshipped God. Even today, this monstrous thought is robbing men of their birthright to happiness and a sense of security. But the time has now come for a clearer understanding of the nature of deity. That there is a God, no one can deny. That there would be a God of vengeance and hate, having all the characteristics of a huge man in a terrible rage. No person can well believe and keep his or her sanity. The power back of all things must be one power. And the clearer the thought of unity, the greater has been the philosophy." Unquote. That was Dr. Holmes. Now I turn from Dr. Holmes 
to a study done by Microsoft. Remember, I'm saying that this message of unity is coming from all boats. Everywhere you look, I turn to Microsoft. That study, among many others, shows how unified the world is in the area of communication. You may have heard the phrase, seven degrees of separation. Well, Microsoft studied billions of electronic messages and concluded, I quote, that any two strangers are, on average, distanced by 6.6 .6 degrees of separation. In other words, putting fractions to one side, you are linked by a string of seven or fewer acquaintances to Madonna, the Dalai Lama, and the Queen, unquote. That was from Microsoft, seven degrees of separation. So you know someone who knows someone who knows someone, etc., who knows Donald Trump. <laughs> that means it's not hard to send him a message. Think about it. How about formulating a message to him in 144 characters? I think that's the length of a tweet nowadays. And he loves tweets. He's doing it at 3 o'clock in the morning. Then pass that, on, that message on to a friend and tell him or her to pass it on further. If the message is flattering to Mr. Trump, you might hear your name mentioned in one of his speeches as a fan from Jamaica. That would be a feather in his cap. Another scientific study showing how unified we are was done by Professor Howard Gardner, not Howard Spencer. You might find it a little strange that I use this one because Gardner's study is about differences. It's his theory of different human intelligences. He says that we have seven basic intelligences or talents. Musical intelligence, mathematical intelligence, linguistic intelligence, which makes us good with languages, kinesthetic or bodily intelligence, which makes good athletes and dancers, social intelligence, which we use to get along with others, spatial intelligence, which is concerned with the use of space, and intrapersonal intelligence, which helps us to understand ourselves psychologically. Those, he says, are the basic ones, but Gardner says that there are other intelligences as well. All of them help us to be successful in this world. Some people have just one or two talents, but being very, very good with just, in just one area could make you successful if you happen to be the fastest man in the world, for example, you could become a millionaire like Usain Bolt. You don't also have to have enough mathematical intelligence to count your money. You could, as a millionaire, hire somebody to do that for you. Of course, Usain not only has good physical intelligence, but he has good social intelligence as well and gets on very well with people, which is why the world not only admires him for his speed, but loves him for his personality. Why do I think this theory about differences in intelligences also speaks to unity? Because I think of society as one engine with a lot of different parts, all working together to accomplish a goal. The world wouldn't be efficient or enjoyable if everyone had the same talents or interests. We are an engine working together. 
I said that there is evidence of being united to, found, to, fa to be found everywhere. So let's now turn to the Bible. There we hear Jesus saying things like, I and the Father are one. He tells us we are our brother's keeper. He says that the second great commandment, love thy neighbor as you love yourself, is as important as the first commandment, love God with all your heart, mind, and strength. Jesus doesn't shun people usually shunned in that, his society at that time. He heals lepers. He has a powerful interaction with the Samaritan woman at the well. He empathizes with the woman taken in adultery, whom other men were ready to stone to death. And he chooses his disciples from ordinary folk, tax gatherers, fishermen, etc. He's clearly what we call an equal opportunity employer. What about you? If you came to believe this morning, not just intellectually, but in your heart, heartically, that unity is the basis of everything, that we are all children of God, we are family, we are brothers and sisters, would you begin this morning to treat people in general differently? Would you treat your neighbor differently? Would you forgive that person, that person, and you know who it is, who wronged you? Would you forgive? Would you be less judgmental of others? And here's a difficult one. If you really believed in your heart that you are a child of God, would you be less judgmental, more forgiving of yourself? You shouldn't only love your neighbor as yourself, you know. You should love yourself as your neighbor. There are, according to the psychologists, four types of relationships. You may say, I'm important, but you're not. You're, I'm important, you're important. That's one. You may say, I am important, you are not important, too. You may say, I am not important, but you're important. And the fourth one, I'm not important, you are not important. The only healthy relationship is the one in which you regard both parties in the interaction as important. The other kinds of relationships lead to problems. The last kind, I'm not important, you are not important, leads to dissolution of that relationship, perhaps to destruction of both parties. And I'm talking the murder and suicide that is so rampant, unfortunately, in our society. I'm not important, you are not important, so anything goes. Jesus didn't believe children should be seen and not heard, as my grandmother often told me. When his disciples were turning away children, Jesus said, allow the little children to come to me and forbid them not, for of such is the kingdom of our God. And elsewhere, he speaks about the importance of listening to children. Here is a story called Grandmother's Table about a little girl who believes in togetherness. Once there was a feeble old woman whose husband died and left her all alone. So she went to live with her son and his wife and their own little daughter. Every day the old woman's sight dimmed and her hearing grew worse. And sometimes at dinner her hands trembled so badly the peas rolled off her spoon or the soup ran from her cup. The son and his wife could not help but be annoyed at the way she spilled her meal all over the table. And one day after she knocked over a glass of milk, they told each other enough was enough. They set up a small table in the corner next to the broom closet. 
and made the old woman eat her meals there. She sat all alone, looking with tear-filled eyes across the room at the others. Sometimes they spoke to her while they ate, but usually it was to scold her for dropping a bowl or a fork. One evening, just before dinner, the little girl was busy playing on the floor with her building blocks, and her father asked her what she was making. I'm building a little table for you and mother, she smiled, so that you can eat by yourselves in the corner someday when I am big. Her parents stared at her for quite a while, and then both began to cry. That night, they led the old woman back to her place at the big table. From then on, she ate with the rest of the family. And her son and his wife never seemed to mind a bit when she spilled something every now and then. And I close with a poem about oneness, <coughs> which I wrote in 2001. It is called Unity Consciousness. Even from then, my unity was on my mind clearly. We are branches of one tree, the fingers of one hand, the voices of one choir, one seashore's sand. We are the steps of one dance, the minutes of one hour, the people of one world drops in a shower. We are the pages of one book, the rays of one sun, the notes of one melody, words of a song. We are the thoughts of one mind, the leaves of one bow, the waves of one ocean, moments of now. We are the trees of one forest, the seeds of one pod, the children of one creator which is God. Namaste.